Hi there, this is Professor Schimmeld with part three of the lecture on mycoses. We're going to pick it up with the, um, the fourth category, systemic mycoses. Now, transmission is typically through inhalation, and that could be inhalation of spores or hyphae or both, and that means that the infection is usually going to begin in the lungs. Now, most of these uh, infections are not serious, but um, a small percentage of them are very significant and even life-threatening, and we'll talk about a couple of examples in a few minutes and I'll, I'll give you some more detail. So transmission, inhalation, level of tissue infected, if these become serious they become systemic infections which means not restricted to any one region of the body system-wide. Okay first example is a disease that's common in uh, the southwestern part of the United States and uh, pretty much most of Mexico called coccidioidomycosis. Um, and because no one's really positive how to pronounce that, we usually refer to it as valley fever. It's caused by inhalation of uh, the spores of a fungus named Coccidioideos imitis. That's my best guess anyways, you guys, for pronunciation. Now, this is a, um, a fungus that lives in the soil, and the, uh, the conditions that it prefers are um, uh, dry, which another word for that would be arid, um, alkaline, and hot soil, which of course describes the conditions in southwestern United States, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico um, even, and um, most of Mexico. Um, and, um, oh, another note about that is that the organism grows especially well when we have a very wet winter followed by an extremely hot, dry summer. We've not had those conditions for a while here in uh, Southern California. We've had exceptionally dry drought conditions uh, for quite some time now. All right, so let's talk about the clinical characteristics of this disease and hang on, let me get caught up in, um, in your outline. Okay, so um, under um, valley fever number one, A, that was uh, transmission, inhalation, and B was level of tissue infected. And of course, like I said, these infections begin in the lungs and become systemic um, if untreated or the immune system isn't able to um, uh, take care of the problem. Okay, clinical characteristics. Most cases are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means without symptoms, uh, or they may um, be subclinical infections. Subclinical means I don't feel well, but I don't think I feel bad enough to go see the doctor. Uh, so those subclinical infections, those patients, they're going to experience some mild symptoms, uh, such as um, a, a cough, uh, which may become chronic. Approximately 1% of infections are going to progress to acute pneumonia. And about half of those individuals, so one half of 1% of the, the total infected individuals, they're going to progress to a systemic infection. And as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, potentially life-threatening. Here are some of the symptoms, and because there are so many of them, I went ahead and uh, listed them in your outline, but let me go ahead and read them um, for those of you that maybe don't have an outline in front of you. Um, all right, so symptoms include blood, tinged sputum. Sputum is the material that's uh, going to be deep down in your lungs. Okay, so what I mean by blood tinged is, is if you were to cough into a tissue, for example, you might just see just a little bit of faint redness there. Um, my favorite symptom here is, would be uh, changes in mental status. That could be um, confusion or even aggression in some cases. Uh, chills, cough, fever, headache, uh, joint stiffness, loss of appetite, uh, otherwise known as anorexia, muscle ache, rash, sensitivity to light, uh, skin lesions are possible. I don't think I, oh yeah, no, I did. There's a picture on the next page of skin lesions. Okay, you get to that point, you're in pretty serious trouble. Um, anyway, skin lesions are possible. Uh, now, this next statement, I've not read any explanation of this, but it has been observed that a high percentage of Caucasian women with this infection will uh, develop an allergic skin reaction in response uh, to the infection. As far as geography is concerned, we've already touched on that a couple of times. Southwestern United States, most parts of Mexico. Uh, population, anybody can get this disease. Um, the predisposing factors are you have to actually inhale 
large quantities of the spores to really have any chance of an infection gaining a foothold. Um, I want to talk about that again for a minute. Now, there are a couple of situations where we may have a higher than um, average number of spores in, in the air, actually floating around in the air, meaning that they can potentially be inhaled. Uh, one example would be when we have very windy conditions. Uh, we have something here in Southern California called Santa Ana winds, and oh man, they're hot. Uh, hot winds blow really hard, and so the spores um, in the hyphae, the, the, the mold, it, it's going to be in the soil. And so when it's very, very windy, a lot of dirt gets blown into the air, including the spores. And because they're so light, they can float around um, in the air for quite a while, increasing the likelihood that an individual uh, inhale enough of them to actually develop a problem. Um, another situation that's been observed is that after um, significant earthquakes, uh, I remember um, running outside of the house after the Big Bear Landers earthquake some years ago. And I just happened to look north at the mountains and I saw it was like a big cloud of uh, dirt just floating um, in the air. And think about all the spores uh, that would be in, um, in, in that air that had been kind of, you know, shooken up and um, um, elevated into the air. So those are a couple of situations where we may see um, a large quantity of spores in the air and um, a higher than usual incidence of valley fever cases. Now, as far as treatment goes, well, remember I told you only um, really um, one half of 1% of infections become serious. Um, I believe we've mentioned uh, amphotericin B, all right? This is a, um, a fairly versatile drug and it, an IV form of this drug would be given to treat the severe cases. Okay, uh, got another example in this category. I just want to see how many examples I gave you guys. Um, I'm just going to go over one more, all right, and that's a disease called histoplasmosis, uh, also known as Mississippi Valley Fever, and this is caused by the mold named Histoplasma capsulatum, um, and it prefers to grow in the manure of bats, chickens, and starlings. Starlings are little black birds. Um, they are pretty widespread, but apparently there are a lot of them in the Mississippi Valley region. All right, so um, we've already talked about transmission and level of tissue infected. That's going to be true for all of the diseases in this category, so inhalation and in the serious cases, uh, systemic infections. Um, again, let's talk clinical characteristics. Again, uh, this disease, or, or I should say this organism, doesn't usually cause disease even after inhalation of the spores or the hyphae. Uh, in this case, about 0.1%, so one-tenth of 1% 1 of infected individuals are actually going to become significantly ill. And uh, those cases are potentially life-threatening. Some of the symptoms that we're going to um, observe would include a general feeling of illness. I, I don't feel well. Um, fever, chest pains, uh, and a dry, non-productive cough. Now, this is a disease that's seen primarily in North America, um, most especially in the Mississippi Valley region, hence the name. Population, uh, this can occur in anyone, but it's more likely to be serious in the elderly and in infants. That's just kind of a generally true statement. And uh, predisposing factors would be, again, inhaling large quantities of the spores, and uh, treatment would be uh, amphotericin B. All right, I'll be right back.